Good evening. Welcome to our midweek prayer service here at Berean Baptist Church. We are glad that you have tuned in wherever you are, wherever you might be. Appreciate that. And uh, you're looking forward to a good service. Brother Aaron's going to be <clears throat> teaching us, bringing us a message tonight. But before he does that, I have several things on my heart. Uh, I'm going to share with you as quickly as I can. Uh, I'll try not to forget them. I don't have them jotted down. But first of all, as most of our folk know by now, I'm sure, and I'm sure there may be some that do not, but one of our precious men, Brother Milo uh, Weaver, went to be with the Lord about 6 o'clock this morning. Milo and Cindy were a precious couple. They were faithful to the church. They loved the church. And uh, we want to ask our church to be much in prayer for Cindy and the family. I was there about four hours with him yesterday. He was uh, not uh, continent. He was not, he was not able to communicate, but we, he did know I was there and we had a good time of fellowship with the family, reading scriptures, praying together and rejoicing together. But it's going to be a difficult time for sister Cindy. So please be much in prayer. I'll try to bring you up to speed quickly. Uh, we cannot have services here as you well know. Uh, so they're going to uh, take him back to Ohio. They're going to have a private family service at the cemetery sometime next week. I'm asking our church, if you will, and I believe this is very important. Uh, I, I really believe it, it's something that we really need to do. So I'm asking you, uh, I wouldn't do it till next week because they're not they're leaving for ohio sunday and they probably will not have the services up there till sometime at the mid or <clears throat> end of next week but i'm asking our church to send cindy and the family a sympathy card and here's the address <clears throat> excuse me cindy weaver six zero five I cannot pronounce the name of the street. I'm going to spell it. 605 M U S K I N G U M. Muskingham, I, I suppose. <laughs> Muskingham Avenue, Northwest. M U S K I N G U M Avenue, Northwest. Brewster, B R E W S T E R, Ohio. Four four six one three. Uh, <clears throat> I'm asking as pastor, as many of you as possible, try to get a card off to them. Uh, I believe it would be the most encouraging thing uh, that we could do uh, to let Cindy know and the family know how much our church loved Brother Milo and we love Cindy. So I, I pray that you'll do that. And I wait about Monday or Tuesday and then send them a card uh, and jot, jot a note, do something. Let them know that we love them as a church uh, at this time. <clears throat> then, as you know, uh, this afternoon, our governor had a news conference. I didn't get in on all of it, so I, did, I have not understood everything that he's trying to do. He's trying to open up quite a bit of the state. I did, I did not get in on it or I missed what he said about the churches. But I believe uh, he, uh, he said that it would be the same that he had before, that it would be a minimum of, what, 50? So, Depends on the size. Huh? Depends on the size of the building. Yeah, and, and, and you still would like to, he would like for them to set six feet apart uh, and no, no hugging. <laughs> That's hard for a Berean. No uh, shaking hands. Uh, that's hard for us, too. So what I'm getting at is this. I've been praying. I've, <clears throat> this is a heavy decision, and I, I just need some input from some of you people out there, uh, if, you, if you will. We had set a date for Sunday week. I don't know whether, I just don't know at this point. Uh, whether I'm comfortable with that or whether enough people are comfortable with that. Now, I know 
even if we didn't open up till September, there would be some that still would be fearful. This fear factor, folks, we've got to get over. The fear of being around people, you've got to get over. You can't live your life like that. Amen. So, but nevertheless, I know there'll be some that would not come. I, and I understand I'm not being critical. I understand that. And if they weren't comfortable, I would not want them. I don't care when we open. If they weren't comfortable, I would not want them to come. But what I'm trying to say is that as sooner or later at one point, we're going to have to resume. And I want you to pray with me about it. I emailed one of my friends in Texas. I, I referred to Paul writing to Corinth. And he said, I have on me the burden of the churches. And as pastor, I've got that burden. I can make the decision myself, but I prefer not to. I would love to get the feeling, the temperature of the church before we finally decide what we're going to do. But I will say again, sooner or later, we must resume church. I appreciate the internet. I appreciate the live streaming, but it is not a substitute for assembling ourselves together in God's house. So pray with me. I'm sincere. I've got this burden. I have to carry it. I have, I pray, I'm asking God to give me wisdom to lead me and guide me as the Holy Spirit would have us to do. And I feel like my decision could be much wiser if I know a little bit of the temperature of some of you people out there. So if you're watching tonight, email me, telephone me, give me some idea what you think, and that will help me. I will appreciate that. Now the sermon's coming later, and Brother Aaron will be bringing that. So we're glad you're here. And we appreciate your prayers. And again, we appreciate those who are uh, supporting the church financially. Uh, it's been a big help. And we can't thank you enough for your faithfulness in that. So God bless you. We love you. And we thank God for you. I'm going to have just a quick word of prayer. Brother Aaron will come and take the service. Father, tonight we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Father, I pray tonight that the Holy Spirit will comfort Cindy and the family. Uh, Milo is already rejoicing. <laughs> he crossed over the, uh, about 6.15 this morning. He left this old earthly ha tabernacle, and he opened his eyes in the presence of his Lord. And God, I thank you for that assurance that we have. I pray for our church. I pray for our people. I thank you, Father, that you've kept our people safe. Uh, Lord, during this time, and we praise you for it. I pray for our nation. I pray for our president. I pray for our governor. I pray, God, for guidance and leadership of those in authority, that they'll make the right decision. And, Lord, by your grace, by your help, by your strength, we'll get back doing what we need to be doing. Bless Brother Aaron tonight giving the message you want us to have, not what we, what we want, but you know what we need. God, I pray that you will uh, speak to us through him in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Brother Aaron. Aaron go at it. <laughs> Amen. Brother Milo was always an encouragement to see in church on a Sunday morning and a Sunday night. Um, Pastor, I do believe if we start church on a Sunday night and a Wednesday night, we won't have to worry about social distancing too much because not that many people attend on those nights. But thank God we can all look online, right? Um, Brother Milo was a big encouragement. Um, I always enjoyed talking with him and Miss Cindy. Um you know, I, it's you start to bear the burdens of some of the members, and that's why we need to congregate as a church so we can carry each other's loads. And um, uh, he will be missed, uh, especially by me. 
and I know by pastor and many of you. Um, but tonight, I title of my, of my uh, I guess it would be a lesson slash sermon. I have trouble discerning between which is which, but the title would be Why Babel? Why Babel? So if you would, please turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5. Why Babel? First Peter chapter number five, verse number 13. First Peter 5:13, the church that is at Babylon elected together with you. Salute you, and so does Marcus, my son. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that it would be your words tonight and not mine. Lord, I ask that it would be your Holy Spirit that moves. Tonight, we're going to deal with a different spirit. And Lord, I just ask that your spirit would persevere. Lord, I I know that it will in the end. And I know based upon how we act, how we live, what we pray for, Lord, we can deter and protect against wicked and evil spirits. But there's one spirit that's going forth trying to destroy all of humanity, Lord. And I ask now, Lord, that you would let those here that would open their hearts tonight, that your word would settle and that they would be strengthened in their knowledge of your word and not carried about by every wind of doctrine, but a slight of men who lie in wait to deceive with their cunning craftiness. Lord, I just ask this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. What I want you to notice and why I chose this verse before I begin, it's a kind of an obscure verse in the New Testament where the Apostle Peter says to the church that is at Babylon. And as I was studying the Bible and going through some of the prophecy I I tend to look at because I always like to be able to discern the times and, you know, be able to see what's going on in the world. Something that kind of struck me was is the saved God's people have always been in Babylon. We've always been in a Babylon. From the time the epistle was penned in in 1 Peter by Peter, um, he was in the Roman Empire along with the apostle John who penned Revelation. Both were in the Babylon of their day, the Babylon of their day. We also know that in the book of Daniel, spanning from the Babylonian captivity to the Medo-Persian Empire, right before the Grecian Empire, that there was a spirit of Babylon, and these men were saved, and they were in that Babylonian captivity. If we look back through the corridor of time, we can see as well that the Egyptian Empire, which is the first major world empire, along with the Assyrian Empire shortly after that, that the Israelites, the Israelites were captive in the land of Egypt. But there's something that all these have in common. And I'd like to go back to the first time in your Bible where Babel or Babylon is mentioned. See, because it's an idea of unity, that's the Tower of Babel. That's the Babylonian captivity. That's the wickedness of the Egyptian pharaoh. That's the wickedness of Nebuchadnezzar and the coming wickedness that's going to hit this whole world. It's a religion with one man at the top, always. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. It's the same language and it's the same speech. It's an idea of commerce. It's an idea of trade. It's a level playing field. Most people today think it's communism or socialism, but that's not the case. Really what it is, is it's Satanism at its core. Communism and socialism is really Satanism because it's man deifying himself and putting his own interests in the interests of fellow man and not serving God and submitting to God and letting God meet your needs and you doing the work that you're supposed to with your own hands and you taking the fruit of the labor of your own hands. I love Brother Milo. What a hardworking man he was. What a self-made man putting God at the top. He put God at the top and God blessed him and wrote him up to be who he was in his life. And I thank God for Brother Milo and men like him that founded our nation on a good work ethic. Unfortunately, 
That's not always the case. So turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter number 10. We're going to read the last verse in Genesis chapter 10 before we jump into chapter 11. Because Genesis chapter number 10, verse number 32, it's really an important perspective that we need to get before we go into this. Because God has a specific will for humanity. God has a, stif- a specific plan for your life. And w- let's see what God has to say in verse number 32. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and they were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Look, I don't have time tonight or I'd lose track of where I want to go with this, but God's will for humanity is that we are divided nations, that we are sovereign nations, that we are divided in this area so that we don't congregate to prove or to pull together a certain type of spirit that exalts man over God. God has a plan and he wants the nations divided and people separated. I'm not against people marrying of other races and nations. But what I'm saying is this tonight, God had a plan for men to go out and multiply and replenish the earth after the flood and set up nations and kingdoms. God had a plan and man wants to tear down God's perfect plan. Always. God wanted us to multiply and replenish the earth. That's why the devil goes after the babies in the womb. You know, it's funny because all these people that are preaching all the the propaganda they're preaching right now, the Bill Gates of the world, the different people that are out there, the, the social elites, the wealthy, all these people, they want you to have less children because they're afraid you're going to eat up all the resources. Hey, guess what? God made this earth for people. He made it for us. And I'm not afraid how many people end up on this earth before the Lord Lord returns. They're not going to eat up all the resources. But I want you to notice something, starting in chapter number 11. God had a plan, but man had his own plan. And, And man in his own wisdom, there's always one thing that he has in common. He wants to be his own God. He also wants to play by his own rules. Why not? He's his own God. And he wants to do it his way. He wants to do everything his way. So tonight I want to go through a few things because there's a spirit that's transcended from Genesis chapter 11 to today. It's the false spirit of a utopian idea. It's the false spirit that man can save himself. It's the false spirit that we're getting better and not worse. But is that what the logical person sees today? Man believes he can just work harder. He can trust in science a little bit more, lean on the doctors and the physicians, eat the right fruit, have the right diet, and he can be his own God. So man has his plan. Chapter 11, verse number one of Genesis reads, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. You know, I really started looking at this to earlier last week and right before I came here tonight. You know, sometimes you read things like that and you think, well, why is it being redundant? Doesn't language and speech mean the same thing? Well, let's see, because that does kind of mean the same thing. But there's also another meaning. In verse number one, language It's a system of communication used by a particular community or country. And many of us today would believe that. Another name in which it it derives the word language from is tongue, a tongue, a language or a tongue. And the word speech means to speak. But it also says the language of a nation, region, group or country. And those two definitions seem a lot alike. They sound like it's the same thing, but there was another definition associated with the word speech that I think is often overlooked. And it's not, though, another definition, but it's the same definition with a different meaning. A formal address or discourse delivered 
to an audience. And the first thing that popped into my mind after I read and looked up that definition was an agenda. There's an agenda. So if you were to look at this in Genesis chapter one, you could say that the whole earth at that time had one language and they had one speech. They had one speech maker and he was promoting this one world movement. He was promoting a globalist agenda. And this is what we see today. It's it's always taking on another name. Some have called it a new world order. Some have called it a one world agenda. Some have called it globalism or the global community, but it's all the same thing. To bring the world under one language, one tongue, one speech, one agenda, and it has nothing to do with Christ. It has nothing to do with, with God Almighty. It has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. It has everything to do with exalting man, but it, it makes sense because that's what Satan said to, to Eve in the Garden of Eden. If you take this fruit, you'll be as a God. So the apple so-called doesn't fall far from the tree. <clears throat> They have one speech, and I jotted a note to myself, they have one mindset. They have one agenda. They have one course of action that they'd like to take tonight. You know, and, and this is all after the flood, and this is humanity's path after God has judged them for all the wickedness in the earth, not because somebody was tampering with genealogies and all this foolish babble that comes out of many of these other false books that have nothing to do with the Bible, but this has to do with the wickedness of man because from his youth, every thought and imagination is wicked continually. We don't need no help from no demons. We have our own flesh. We have our own will. We are rebellious at nature. Don't need any help being rebellious. Quit telling me the devil made you do it. He didn't make you do anything. The Bible says, submit yourself unto God. Draw nigh to him. He'll draw nigh to you. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Don't hand me this. The devil made you do it. Starting in verse number five. Genesis 11, and the Lord came down to see the city and tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one and they all have one language and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. They, you can't, you can't blame someone else for your own actions. They imagined to do it and did it. Therefore, God said, go to let us go down, us, plural. And there confounded their language that they may not understand one another's speech or plan. See, they're trying to build something. And when God confounded their languages and broke up language, he confounded their speech. He broke up their plan, their agenda. So the Lord scattered them abroad from the from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. But you know what? They left off to build the city at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Keep this in your mind tonight. They may have stopped back then, but this spirit of Babylon has been carried through the ages of humanity. They may have left off building this city, but Babylon and the spirit of Babylon or the spirit of Antichrist is continuing to try to build that one world unified city that opposes and exalteth itself above God and all that is called God. That's why the Antichrist will go and sit in the temple of God saying that he is God. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord there confounded their language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. See, God had to break this up. And unfortunately today, the Internet's a great tool. We get a lot accomplished with it. Our jobs are... 
I don't think my job's any easier because of it. Matter of fact, my job's harder. Used to be easier to sit down with a pen, write up a, a bill and mail it to someone. And now you got to write emails and sometimes they don't send. Sometimes they come back. Sometimes your server's down or this, that, and the other thing. And your phone doesn't work and you can't text. And why don't you have Wi-Fi? And I, you know, sometimes I think the more things change, the worse they get. Things that are supposed to help us end up hindering us. I, I feel like that half the time in my job. But I want you to know something. These things are all pushing the world in a direction of unity towards globalism, towards a one world government. The speech is more alive today. The building that, that was put off in the Tower of Babel and they left off building the city, they're starting to rebuild that city. And why not? That spirit has never died. And I believe it's called globalism today. One world unified, the term new world order. It doesn't matter what it is. People say, hey, hey, brother Aaron, you sound like a conspiracy theorist. One can't read the Bible without seeing conspiracies throughout. I looked up the word conspiracy is mentioned 10 times. Conspirators mentioned once, conspired 19 times. But what do you expect? Jesus, uh, Judas conspired against Jesus and had Christ crucified. There's conspiracies throughout the whole Bible, Christian. Wake up. Wake up. It's ridiculous. Oh, I don't want to. Look, there is a bunch of nonsense on the Internet. But guess what? There's a lot of nonsense in the news. Hey, there's a non lot of nonsense everywhere. But you know where you're going to get the truth? Right here. It's where you're going to get the truth. The spirit of Babylon has rested on the world at this time. I believe this spirit has taken its seat in the world today, in many of our leaders today. The spirit moves, but it's no new thing because I would like to turn to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation is the last book in your Bible. We're leaving the first book in your Bible. And the more things change, the more they've stayed the same. Just stayed the same. Man's not getting better. He's getting worse. You'd think we'd learn from our mistake. That's why God uh, had uh, Ecclesiastes penned and Proverbs penned. And at the hand of King David, there were many words of wisdom penned. What is wisdom? You learn it from experience. You can be taught all the book knowledge you want, but wisdom is what you need to obtain. What works and what doesn't work. Going against God never works. Going against God's law don't work. But yet Christians flirt with it every day. Every day. Sorry, I got a little bit preachy. Um, <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 17, verse number 1 through 3. I want to read this because I want to slow down a little bit. Hopefully I can. I have... Uh, I did have a cup of coffee before I came in tonight. So in Revelation 17, verse number one, the Bible reads, And there came one of his seven of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, we're going to slow down just a little bit right here because there's a lot to cover in those first three verses. And I've heard these butchered by some of the best theologians so-called. What we're going to look at tonight is seven heads and ten horns. Seven heads and ten horns. Now, I also want you to notice a part of the verse number one out of chapter 17. Keep this in your mind because it's going to come up a little bit later. I want you to notice the part where it says, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. The many waters part is really important. So keep that in the back of your mind tonight. So starting in verse number four, the Bible reads, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head, her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great 
imagination, admiration. This can come across somewhat confusing at the start. But what I want you to notice as I explain it in verse number seven, what we see here is we see what appears to be a mystery. And a lot of people will just go through this real quickly and they won't slow down and they'll kind of skim through that part to get to the rest. But this is really important because this isn't a mystery at all. See, there's seven heads and there's 10 kings. There's a beast and there's a woman who's a whore. Okay? And throughout the entire Bible, false religion, pulling people away from God and his plan is a whore. God would always say that Israel had committed fornication with him, or they've gone after false gods, that Israel was God's wife, that all these things, and now we're the bride of Christ. And here's the thing. The whore is someone who comes in and sneaks in and pulls you away after your own lust or your own uh, inability to contain yourself. And what happens is, Christian, I'm going to relate it to today. What happens is when the false prophet comes in, having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin, unstable, he pulls you away because guess what? That's what your nature wants to do. Break away from God because you have a flesh. You have a flesh and it's a spiritual adultery you'll commit. And this is a spiritual fornication that many who say they love the Lord are committing. Well, how do you know that? Let's read on. Verse number seven. And the angel said unto me, wherefore did thou marvel? Why are you confused? Can't you see it? Haven't you seen it throughout the corridors of time, starting in the beginning in Genesis? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her. Hmm. The beast that carrieth her. Yeah, I've seen so many poor descriptions of what this is supposed to be. But I'm going to show you right now from the Bible, using it in context, who that beast is. The beast that carrieth her, which have the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, to somebody who's not saved, that's going to sound like a lot of gibberish. And to many Christians who are new in the faith, don't don't get worried. That can get a little bit confusing. But I want you to notice that the beast that thou sawest was and is not. There's coming a ruler, a beast, a worse ruler than all the seven that had come before or six that had come before. He's the beast that's going to lead you into fornication against God. He's going to draw you away with the spirit of Babylon into your own worship and into the worship of him over God. That's what this guy's going to do. He's a beast because he's an animal. He's a beast because he becomes the devil. He's a beast and he dies and he comes back. And I don't know if we'll get to it tonight. I've heard so many people and, and all their commentaries from their cemeteries and their sanctuaries. And it's all quite scary to me. But I'm going to tell you right now, they're not paying attention what the scripture says because the scripture defines the scripture tonight. And I'm telling you right now, here's the problem we have. These people are going to reject Jesus because of the spirit of Babylon. Look at look at verse number eight, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. He is going to deceive everybody who is not saved. There is going to be a very deciding line when this guy comes about that he is going to he's going to close caption for the spiritual hearing and impaired. And he's going to deceive many tonight. And that's why 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is so important. It says, and for this God, and for this cause, God shall send a strong delusion. Not only will they have the delusion of the beast and the fornication of the whore and the fact that they're not saved, but God himself will send a strong delusion. Why? Because the verse before that says, because they love not the truth 
that they might be saved. Hey, listen, if you're saved, your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. But Jimmy DeYoung and John MacArthur say, hey, if you take the mark of the beast and you're deceived, you can just cut it out. But this mark is in your hand or your forehead and you can cut it out all day long. But that mark ends up on your heart and you're not cutting your heart out because that's who you are and that's what you chose. It has nothing to do with anything physical. It has to do with the spirit. And these men are leading people astray. And you know what? In verse 8, these repro many reprobates will fall for it. They'll fall for it. They rejected Jesus and killed him. Of course they'll reject his servants and kill him. Of course they'll have the blood of the saints. Of course they'll have all these things. But verse number 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. Wisdom. What's the experience we need to learn here? The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now I've heard I've heard this butchered more than I care to care to talk about because the word mountains does not mean hills. The word mountains here does not mean what you think it means. Well, how are you going to prove that tonight, Brother Aaron? Well, let's go back to the other prophetic book in the book of Daniel to chapter number three of the book of Daniel. Let's find out what a mountain actually means. Let's find out what a mountain really is. Because it isn't a hill, and almost every version, every version other than the King James Bible manipulates that into hills. So in Daniel chapter number 2, verse number 31. I'm sorry, did I say 3? I meant 2. <clears throat> verse number 31 of the book of Daniel. Thou, O king, sawest... And behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and, and form therefore was terrible. And the form therefore thereof was terrible. Easy for me to say. This image head was of fine gold. His breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till the stone which was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chafe of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, we'll get into this study later. I don't know if it'll be the next Wednesday night or another night. I don't know where God wants me to go with this. But I want you to know that this speaks of Jesus being the stone that was cut out without hands. Jesus is the stone that comes and smites the world's kingdoms and destroys them. But here's the thing. This, this stone becomes a great mountain, and it covers the whole earth. Now, physically speaking, there's no mountain that can cover the whole earth, right? Unless that mountain were a kingdom. And Christ's thousand-year millennial reign is a kingdom that'll cover the whole earth. Well, Brother Aaron, I don't know how you got that from there. Okay, turn to Jeremiah chapter 51 then. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 51. Because you need to understand something tonight. You need to understand that the Bible interprets the Bible, not other books interpreting the Bible, other men telling you what it says. Spiritual things discern spiritual things. Jeremiah 51, verse number 24. Jeremiah 51, 24. And I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of the child of Chaldea, or Chaldea, all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight, saith the Lord. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord. What mountain is God against? The kingdom of Babylon, the mountain of men. God, they're a tower of Babel that they're constantly trying to build up to control the world. Their speech, their same speech of a one world government, they're destroying mountain, which is going to destroy most of humanity. That's 
what that mountain is, saith the Lord, which destroyed all the earth. And I will stretch out my hand upon thee, if this wasn't enough, and roll thee down from the rocks, and I will make thee a burnt mountain. Why? Because Jesus is going to set up his own mountain, his own kingdom, which will rule the entire earth. And they shall not take of thee a stone for a corner. Hey, when Jesus comes and reigns, nobody else is going to reign. He's going to be the king of kings and Lord of lords. And if he puts me in charge of something for what I've done here on earth, I don't care what it is. I'm thankful he's given it to me. But make no mistake, he's still going to be the king. And he doesn't share his kingship with any man or anyone nor a stone for foundations, but they, thou shalt be desolate forever, saith the Lord. Hey, Babylon, hey, Babel, hey, Egypt, hey, Assyria, you're all destroyed. You're all destroyed mountain under God's kingdom. Hey, you one world government, you men that think you're in charge, you antichrist types, you people that are trying to unify under globalism, communism and socialism and feminism and whatever other ism you want to come up with, it's wicked. Wicked. It's a burnt mountain. Even though it was a destroying mountain at one point, and it's going to destroy many others. See, Jesus says here, hey, you spirit of Babylon. Back in the day when you were Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar, you were a destroying mountain. And now in the future, you're going to destroy the martyrs of Jesus. You're going to destroy the saints. You're going to kill many innocent people. You're going to keep aborting babies. You're going to keep doing all wickedness. But guess what? Your judgment's coming. Oh, spirit of Babylon. Oh, mountain of sin. You wicked thing, you. It's coming to an end. The spirit moves the spirit moves <clears throat> keep that thought in your head keep that thought in your head what a mountain really is because i do want to talk a little bit about how to keep this from taking place because you know what i the more i read the bible the more i see what god's people can do I really do. I look at the Bible and I see all the positive examples that God's people have done, all the miracles that Jesus did, all the great evangelistic crusades that the disciples went on. I look at Moses as he led the Israelites out of the out of out of Egypt and into the wilderness and Joshua brought them into the promised land. I look at all the great accomplishments. And therefore I want to turn to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17. Matthew chapter number 17. I don't think anything in here is by accident. This is after they've been on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Verse number 20. And Jesus said unto them, Behold, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, that you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Hey, Christian, I want to talk to you tonight. Everybody sits there and they look at that verse, and they say, I have the kind of faith that can move a mountain. Yeah, but Jesus is talking about the kind of faith that moves a nation. A kingdom by prayer and fasting we can change this nation because of your unbelief Christian we're losing the battle not because it's not our battle to win we're losing it because we don't believe we can win he's not talking about some petty physical thing that you can touch he's not talking about you getting some kind of superpower he's talking about you having a kind of faith that moves a kingdom that changes a nation. And by prayer and fasting, you can change the hearts of men and women tonight. But we don't want to because we're lazy. Let's just say it like it is. Our churches are empty and not just because of the coronavirus. Sometimes the truth is a hard pill to spot, a swallow. But let me tell you something. If you go to your doctor and he tells you to do something, you'll do it. You come to church to your spiritual doctor. He tells you what to do and you don't listen. And you wonder why you're spiritually anemic. 
and you don't have an answer for anyone or anything for everybody who comes and asks of the hope of the reason of, of, of what lives in you because it's the Holy Spirit of God and you're trying to pray and fast and you're failing at it because you don't believe you can do it. And we need to believe that we can do it tonight. We can do it as a church. We can do it as a nation. We can do it around the world. We can put God where he needs to be. But let me tell you something. We're going up against a worthy adversary. This spirit of Babylon is not a, a, a weak foe. And the disciples asked the question to Jesus, how come we couldn't cast out that demon? And Jesus said, because you really didn't believe you could. He said, this kind can only go out by prayer and fasting. He didn't say this kind can only go out because I'm Jesus and I'm God. He said, you could have done it, but you chose not to do it because you got in the way. And we need to get out of the way tonight and get on our knees tonight and praise God tonight and thank God tonight because we still live in the greatest nation on earth. But I don't know how long that's going to last. Why? Because there is a unity movement, a spirit of Babylon trying to take over this nation tonight, trying to destroy our country. And it's about time men start getting up and standing up and doing something about it. Oh, Brother Aaron, you preach too hard. Hey, you know what? We've heard the ice cream, cookies and cake sermons far too long. And where has that gotten us? Where has that gotten us? All these weak churches that just fill it up and the pastor wears $3,500 pair of gym shoes and tells everybody how great they can be when his wife's driving a $100,000 car. Yeah, his life's real great and the rest of everybody else's life sucks. Sick of it, man. This world's lost its head. Why? Because there's a spirit of Babylon. There's a unity movement. They're pulling people together. That's an ecumenical movement. It's a one world united movement. I could go on for six more hours. I'm just getting started. I'm just getting started. You know, I kind of felt tired after it was hot this this afternoon. And I, anyway, word of God just fills me up. I love it. I love it. Because I want to make a difference. I want to make a change. Verse, uh, sorry, turn to Revelation chapter number 17 again. Revelation 17. I don't know if we'll have time to get back into Daniel, but we'll leave you with this, at least this part tonight. I, I mean, I just, I can't believe, I can't believe all the, all the technology we have and, and, and so many can only come up with these really weird spiritual doctrines and weird things. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm too simple minded. You know, maybe I'm not educated enough. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm educated too much. Maybe, maybe I'm not country. Maybe I'm too country. Maybe I'm too manly. Maybe I'm not enough manly. You know, maybe I'm not this and maybe I'm not that. But, but I'll tell you this, I might be a nut, but I'm screwed on the right bolt. And that bolt is the Bible, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God and God the Father. I, I'm, I'm screwed on to the right thing. I may sound like a raging lunatic half the time. And yeah, I may feel like one. But I'll tell you right now, I'm sick of seeing us just compromise and turn over this nation, which God has given us to just all the wicked filth of this world. I'm just sick of it. We've just totally thrown our hands in the air and said, here, devil, take it. Verse number nine of Revelation 17. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. We went over that. On which the woman sitteth. So there's a spiritual wickedness that sits on the seven world kingdoms that these seven kings sit on. How do you know that? Verse number 10. And there are seven kings. Well, guess what? A king sits on a kingdom. A ruler sits on his throne. Someone in power and in charge is always in authority. And in this passage, it's going to make a lot more sense. Five are fallen. Egypt is gone. No longer a world empire. Pharaoh has lost his throne. The Assyrians, they no longer, even though they relied on their military strength, the height of their walls, they said, hey, nobody can take us down. Guess what? Their walls have crumbled and now they're nothing but about two foot piles of dust. They got destroyed. Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar, gone. Medo-Persian, gone. Alexander the Greek, gone, gone. Hey, guess what? 
They're gone. Five are fallen. And one is. What one is that? John is on the Isle of Patmos during the Roman rule. And one is. So five are gone and one is. And that's Rome. And the other, the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he continue. He must continue a short space. See, many of these world empires continued for a pretty good length of time, and they handed the kingdom down to lesser men. Unfortunately, I feel like that's what's happened in America. We've been handed it, we've been handing it down from the greatest generation that has been born in America, has been handed down to lesser men, a rebellious, dope smoking, fornicating hippie generation, which turned out some of the most wicked, wicked young adults I've ever seen, with some of the worst morality that's ever hit this nation, and they're producing kids that they can't control. When's it gonna end? When are you gonna break the cycle? Now, I'm not saying all baby boomers and stuff have, are wicked because we got many precious saints in here tonight or in our church that, that are God-fearing, God-loving, love America, patriotic, but there's many tonight that would sell us right down the river. I'm talking about the Nancy Pelosi crowd. Sell you right down the river for a $25 gallon of ice cream. Isn't that what she just gorged on? Her and her fake face. <clears throat> verse number 11 and the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition now this can come across somewhat confusing and i've probably overstepped my timeline but since pastor went almost an hour i feel like i got 10 more minutes so let's continue. So what it is, is, is this seventh kingdom is going to be brought in, as the Bible says, by the man of sin. And this man of sin, when he is killed, he will be the eighth because it will be an indwelt being of the devil. Well, how do you know that? Because he's the one that goes into perdition, the devil, destruction. He's the one that ascends out of the bottomless pit at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. He's the only one ever allowed to come out. All the others are gone. Judas Iscariot died, went to hell. He'll stay there forever. Satan's the only one that ascends out of the bottomless pit. But you'd have to understand the English language to understand that. That might be above a few people. <clears throat> and I'm going to say this too, because a lot of people have said, how do you know the Antichrist is going to die? and come back to life? How do you know it's not going to be a fake ploy? I'll tell you why, because people aren't going to be deceived by a fake. And the Bible says here in verse number, uh, verse number 11, and the beast that was and is not. And when the Bible talks about somebody who was and is not, when Joseph was sold into slavery, the brothers went to J Jacob, the father, and said, Jake, Joseph is not. That means he's dead. And they produced a bloody cloak. So the term is not means the person's not here. Person's no longer alive. Let's turn to Revelation chapter number 13. I don't know if I'll, I'll be able to cross-reference like I want to. Because I need you to see that there's a spirit that moves across this world. There's a spirit of Babylon that came from the Tower of Babel. Yeah. There's a speech, and we hear it today. There's a there's a, a a common language spoken among world leaders, and that is an ecumenical one world financial movement with religious implications, monetary, and with the rule of one being in charge. Revelation chapter 13, verse number one. We got a few minutes. I'm going to start this. I'll maybe get into it by next Wednesday, or I may continue it in Sunday school, depending. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. I'm going to stop right there. In Revelation 17, there was the woman or the whore that sat on many waters. The spirit of Babylon has been on many waters. So what do we have? We have John looking at the sea, and there's a beast rising out of the sea. Out of the nations, there's coming a one world ruler. One man in control. How do you know that? And saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his head, his head's the name 
of blasphemy. This antichrist that comes, this beast that comes out of many waters, out of many nations, look, I don't care where you think the Babylon is or where you think, it doesn't really matter. Because the truth of the matter is, it's a spirit of Babylon. And it's being promoted today. And wherever they choose to have it take place really doesn't matter. It's out there. But marvel not, see, because John said there's a spirit of Antichrist already among you today. And he was talking about it back 2,000 years ago. Verse number two. And the beast which I, which I saw was like unto a leopard, and, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the, dra worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Why would they say that? Why could they say that? Because he came back from the dead. That's why. And he's indwelt with Satan. Why, why would you say that? Why wouldn't you say it's some Old Testament villain or Judas Iscariot? Why would you say it's not them? I'll tell you why. The same reason why the devil indwelt Judas Iscariot. The job's too big for a man. The devil doesn't want to let us go. He hates you. He hates me. He hates all of humanity. He wants us dead. That's why he has us abort our children. That's why he has us uh, constantly into violence and things that just corrupt our minds. That's why he has us into fornication and adultery so we can get a sexually transmitted disease and die. That's why, or that you can be at the hands of somebody's husband or wife because they've lost their mind because you've cheated on them with their spouse or you've cheated, however it works out, and they've taken your life. Why? Because the devil knows if he can get you into sin, he can get the blessing of God removed from you and he can have you killed because he hates you and he has always hated us from the very beginning because we're creating the image of God and he's not. He's a loser and he's going to go to hell. And I'm glad he's going to hell. And I thank God he's going to hell because that's what he deserves. Man, you can't, you can't tell me. I've, I've heard people say, boy, God would forgive the devil if he asked. No, God would never forgive the devil. And I'm glad. I'm glad. You know why? Because God is just. And there's a no iniquity found in him. The balance, the scales... They've read zero on the devil. I don't know if I should close there or not or keep going. I want to keep going. The waters are representation of people, languages, and nations. The spirit of Babylon has moved across the sea. It's all over the place. It's moved across humanity. It's going to keep on going until the end unless we, as God's people, get some doggone faith, start believing we can move kingdoms and mountains, and we start fasting and praying and getting a hold of the garment of Jesus Christ and saying, Lord, for our our kids sake give us another chance give us some more time lord it's on us to do that we're the ones that hold the key we're the ones why because we have the bible we have god's word if the gospel be hid it's hid to them that are lost we've got the light we've got the candle we've got everything that they need but yet we don't believe we can do anything with it don't believe we can do anything with it. I'm going to close here because I don't want to get people confused. But if you want to read ahead, we're going to end up in Daniel chapter number 7 because uh, we'll go back and forth between Revelation 13 and Daniel chapter 7 in our next study because there's a lot of people that that aren't clear on, on what, um, what these animals represent. And I'm going to go over it in very great detail. And I'm going to go slow and we can see it because all the answers are right here in this book. This is all we ever need. So let's go ahead and uh, we're going to pray. But before we do, I, wanna, I want each one of us in our heart to, to pray a special prayer tonight. I want each one of us to pray that God strengthens each and every one of us, that we can have our faith strengthened. See, they couldn't cast out that demon because their faith was weak and unbelief. Jesus said, some of these demons are tough for you. He had no problem. 
but for us, they were difficult. And there's a lot of demons running around, not just the spirit of Babylon, spirit of wickedness, the spirit of alcoholism, spirit of fornication, pornography, the spirit of a foul tongue, the spirit of stealing, the spirit of blasphemy. There's a lot of wicked spirits running around that would love to deceive you. And I want to pray tonight that each one of us would gather some strength to fight back. I'm going to show you in Daniel what made Daniel a great warrior, a spiritual warrior. And how God answered him many times because he did have faith. And he did go to the Lord in prayer, even when he was told not to. So I want each of us tonight as we bow and pray, I want us to each pray that we would have some strength to battle these demons. Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against wickedness, the spiritual darkness of this world. We wrestle against things we can't even see. And we can take them down because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So tonight when we bow for prayer, I want each one of us to search our own heart. And if there's any doubt, get it settled. You don't need to doubt. If there's fear, cast it out. If there's something you need to fast, not everybody's fast is the same thing. Not everybody needs to abstain from the same things. Cast it out and pray. Because see, the battle is ours to win. There's always been a spirit of Babylon, and I want to take it down. I don't want it to come upon this nation. I want to cast it out. And everyone who has family, I'm sure you do too. What can we leave the next generation? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you would strengthen me, that you would strengthen my faith, that we could take back this kingdom, this mountain, and we can tell it to go back where it came from, the wicked part. We could kick it back over the sea, the wickedness, the wicked people that have gotten in power in our nation and have tried to destroy it. Never thought I'd live to see the day, but yet here we are. Lord, I'm asking tonight that you help me to get things out of my life that I need to get out of. I ask that you strengthen me even stronger. Lord, make me more stubborn in your word. Make me more stubborn concerning you. Make me rely on you even that much more. Make me call on you and think on you. Give me strength to get things out of my life that I can draw closer to you and get power over the spirit of Babylon, the spirit of the devil, that we can move this kingdom in the right direction. Oh, your hand was on America for many, many years. What a godly country early on. Oh, Lord, we've fallen so far. We've fallen backwards. Oh, Lord, I ask you help us. Please, strengthen your people. Strengthen us. Lord, you're never far away. You're always right there. In the book of Isaiah, every time Israel got into wickedness, the Bible read, but your hand was still stretched out for the taking. Lord, I want to take your hand tonight. I want to take it from Brother Milo, who's hugging you in glory. And I want to take it from him for just a moment. And I want to feel your power and your strength and your resolve. And I want to do something great for you. I don't know. I don't, I don't even know where to get started sometimes. And Many of us are, were lost in this area. Where do we even begin? But take us like children, Lord, and just lead us and help us to go in that direction. Our kids depend on it. They depend on it. 
Lord, I thank you for letting me know Brother Milo. I thank you for letting me know Brother Jim Goss. I thank you for letting me know Brother Bob Hunter. I thank you for letting me know Brother Buddy, Brother Bud Renos. I thank you for letting me know those that have passed away, others that I, Brother, Brother Marvin from our church. Friendship is a gift. And I thank you for letting me know all these people. And Lord, I look forward to those that are in our church when we can gather together again. Lord, I ask you give the pastor the wisdom to discern when it's time. Because we need to redeem the time because the days are evil. We need to be back in the sweet fellowship, leaning on one another and strengthening one another as a church always does, as this church does. Lord, I just thank you for everything you've given me, and I don't take one breath for granted. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.